where we start. And I think most people know the Great Lakes experience multiple stressors, climate change, invasive species, excess nutrients, and many others. Um, researchers and the public, however, we, we often think about stressors as individual elements. It's much easier to do so, to look at um, each occurrence of an element as, as an independent sort of event. In fact, most management programs and legislation focus on individual stressors but we know that many stressors co-occur. We wanted to look at how best to consider and to model, to quantify the integrative impacts of multiple stressors. This is really a very challenging question. For these reasons, the Science Advisory Board convened a working group to explore the consequences of multiple potentially interacting stressors in the Great Lakes. This webinar now will present their findings and recommendations. I'm looking forward to it just like the rest of you. And Matthew, I'm gonna send it back to you now. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, we will have uh, four presenters for today's webinar, and the next slide uh, shows each of them. Dr. Dave Allen uh, recently concluded his term on the IJC Science Advisory Board and was the project lead and primary author of the Interacting Stressors Project Report. Dr. Allen is Professor Emeritus, School for Environment and Sustainability, in University of Michigan, and will be, will be presenting information on the project purpose and context and its findings and recommendations. Dr. John Bratton is a senior scientist at Limnotech. Limnotech served as the project contractor with, the, with Dr. Bratton as their lead. Dr. Bratton will be presenting the stress interaction case study on increased precipitation and phosphorus loading. Dr. Karen Kidd is a member of the IJC Science Advisory Board and is a professor at McMaster University where she holds a joint appointment between the Department of Biology and the School of Earth, Environment and Society. Dr. Kidd will be presenting the stressor interaction case study on toxic chemicals and phosphorus. Dr. Mike Murray is a member of the IJC Science Advisory Board and is staff scientist at the National Wildlife Federation's Great Lakes Regional Center. Dr. Murray will be presenting the stressor interaction case study on wetland loss and mercury. And without further ado, let's get started with today's presentation. Over to you, Dr. Allen. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, all. I add my welcome and thanks to webinar attendees. We really appreciate this opportunity to share the findings from our report. So as this slide illustrates, there have been a number of studies that have looked at multiple stressors throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, I think a particularly influential study by Sterner et al, uh, which identified grand challenges uh, facing the Great Lakes. It's a source of the quote at the lower left. Uh, that there's an urgent need to understand whether the ecosystem response to multiple stressors is simply additive or involves synergistic or antagonistic effects. The map shown just above it, uh, a product of a project with, with uh, many participants and funded by the Herb Family Foundation, maps the sum of 34 individual stressors across the surface of the Great Lakes. And it shows that many stressors co-occur and that those stressors uh, are particularly uh, uh, likely to occur along the coastlines or margins of the lakes and in the most uh, southerly part of the basin. So I want to make at the beginning just a few key points that set the stage for this project and really echo uh, comments made uh, just a moment ago by Dr. Miller. It is well known that multiple stressors affect the Great Lakes. Whether multiple stressors interact and whether these interactions enhance or offset stress is actually the focus of a great deal of research um, around the world in both freshwater and marine ecosystems. And yet we really uh, have only a limited understanding of how the influence of multiple stressors plays out in terms of total or cumulative stress. So at the heart of this issue of interacting stressors, if I may have the next slide, please, is cumulative or total stress. It is difficult to evaluate cumulative stress without a better understanding of stressor interactions. 
There's a growing literature that explores stressor interactions and uses terms such as additive, multiplicative, synergistic, and antagonistic, which I'll give definitions of in just a moment. And it's apparent that a deeper understanding of interaction between pairs of stressors is the important and really crucial first step to better understanding cumulative stress and whether such information can inform management actions. So to define some terms, if I may go to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I wanna refer you to the chart on the right and two hypothetical stressors, A and B, both of which uh, cause some form of ecosystem stress. And in this illustration, uh, B has the stronger impact than A. If we then ask what's the combined influence of A and B together, uh, we see several possibilities. The first given is the additive example where the influence of the two stresses together is simply their additive sum. If the influence of those two stressors together is greater than the additive sum, we use the term synergy or synergistic. Uh, and if it's less than the sum, we refer to it as an antagonism. In some cases, and we will explore one with you later in the webinar, an antagonism may be so strong that it's really an offset. Um, finally, uh, another possibility that needs to be considered is that the dominant stressor, per perhaps in this case, stressor B, simply trumps other stressors in the system and so is the only influence that really matters. That's analogous to what ecologists refer to as the law of the minimum, where whichever factor most strongly limits population or ecosystem response is the one that determines population or ecosystem response. And a well-known example is nutrient limitation of algal blooms. You know, phosphorus is the a nutrient that's in shortest supply relative to the demand of the algal populations, then it determines the size of the bloom and the amount of nitrogen or silica or other nutrient uh, is simply not important. So clearly then there's a range of outcomes when we have two stressors occurring together. And in the next slide, we illustrate some findings from, from other studies. And as I mentioned earlier, there have been numerous uh, attempts to look at across studies using some form of synthesis or quantitative meta-analysis of individual studies of pairwise stressors to try to determine what the general pattern is. Uh, the study by Crane et al., uh, one of the early studies of this kind, was looking in marine ecosystems. Darling and Cote surveyed data from both uh, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Jackson et al. was a study of freshwater ecosystems, uh, a net meta-analysis of multiple stressors. The Smith et al. study looked specifically at the Great Lakes, and the Herring al. Uh, refers to a, a large European project called MARS, by the way, that stands for Managing Aquatic Ecosystems and Water Resources Under Multiple Stress. Uh, and the uh, MARS project looked um, at European, ri mostly rivers and small lakes, uh, so four of those five are graphed on the left, and you can see that many found antagonistic uh, interactions to occur, synergistic interactions to occur, roughly similar uh, frequency and, and additive to be less common. In contrast, the European work, the Mars Project, uh, which focused primarily on, as I said, rivers and small lakes, and primarily on temperature and nutrients concluded that additive was the most common outcome. So clearly there's a range of, of outcomes and much to be learned about which are most likely to occur in the circumstances that might influence which are most likely to occur. So if I may go to the next slide, please. Uh, let me just say a few things specifically about this project, as Dr. Miller indicated, uh, a project of the Science Advisory Board Science Priority Committee and it involved a, a working group of large number of, of uh, researchers and scientists, a facilitated workshop that's brought in some additional experts and additional literature synthesis that was carried out by uh, Limnotech, the contractor on the project. And the goals are as set forward here to identify a subset of priority stressors affecting the Great Lakes ecosystem, 
and try to evaluate the likelihood of interactions between pairs of stressors. We did so by focusing on the likely mechanism of stressor interactions and the potential that, that an interaction could result in enhanced harm or reduced harm. And here I need to point out an important uh, nuance of, of our work. Because we were uh, using the uh, literature review and our understanding of the mechanisms uh, by which stressors could interact, we really could best determine whether we thought that stressors were likely to interact in such a way as to enhance uh, overall stress in the system or to offset it. Uh, and so uh, we, we really were looking at those two outcomes uh, as a consequence of each interaction and then attempted to explore the implications for a management response. The work group, uh, include, may I have the next slide, please? The work group um, was, was a large group, uh, including advisory board members of the IJC, external members, which as you can see, uh, were from uh, US, Canada and around the world, uh, a contractor uh, by uh, Limnotech, and as I mentioned, when we had a, a facilitated workshop, we were fortunate to bring in some additional expertise as well. So we had a, a lot of good advice. And so as I'll show you in the next slide, we identified seven stressors, which we chose out of many that could be considered for their importance in the Great Lakes. And these are, as, as listed here, invasive species, toxic chemicals, nutrients, climate change, habitat loss, fish harvest, and pathogens. And each of these is really a category of stressors at the higher level, a broad category such as toxic chemicals or invasive species. But clearly uh, there's a, a, a range of, of different invasive species which may have different geographies and influence, a range of toxic chemicals likewise. And so in trying to think through and evaluate stressor interactions, uh, we started with broad categories, but we use these uh, more specific examples as the best pathway into the literature and into the mechanisms. Uh, and <clears throat> our evaluations uh, were largely qualitative um, to try to evaluate the likelihood of additive synergistic or antagonistic outcomes. The next slide shows you a summary of our findings and uh, those seven priority stressors could, could provide as many as 21 possible pairwise combinations. And I think you can anticipate that, that the number of possible combinations to uh, consider is even larger than, than what we considered here. Uh, we chose 11 to be uh, focused on in detail because of, of their importance uh, or because of the availability of, of knowledge. So those gray shaded cells are simply redundant and an NC stands for not considered, again, because we felt that the, that particular interaction was of lesser concern or less well understood. The results then of our findings are summarized pretty much in this one slide. If we felt that a particular interaction, for example, between climate change and invasive species, the evidence indicated that additive or synergistic outcome and enhancing outcome was likelihood, was likely, uh, you see a plus or slash plus plus because again, it was difficult to distinguish between additive or synergistic. If we thought it was possible that an interaction could uh, either enhance or offset, as we will see an example um, uh, later, but for example, with climate change and toxic chemicals, you see a minus slash plus. And if we thought that the likely influence was an offset or antagonism, you see a minus. And so there was really only one example that we thought fell in that uh, uh, offset or antagonism uh, category. Uh, a couple of examples that we thought could go either way. And in the majority of cases, we anticipate that an interaction between two stressors is likely to result in increased uh, stress of an additive or synergistic nature. Now, if I may have the next slide, please. It became apparent to us in our discussions fairly early on that context matters a lot, um, that there's spatial and temporal variation in stressor occurrence. And that determines whether two stressors will even, as one uh, speaker put it, will even see one another 
possibility for stressors to interact requires that they're both present in space and time. And the intensity of their interactions likely is influenced by um, their, uh, their uh, intensity in, in that particular location. Nonetheless, many stressors are most prevalent in, as that map showed, in nearshore areas, near river mouths and urban areas, and in embayments. So while some species are, um, like invasive species, will have different distributions and have different influence, we need to keep in mind sort of the complexity of context here. And climate illustrates uh, this well. So for example, warming trends vary across the lake separately from precipitation intensity and runoff in their geography. And these two climate variables have different seasonal effects. So there's um, uh, much uh, important detail associated with how stressor interactions vary with location, timing, and across scale, all of which merits further study. With the next slide, I want to introduce our three case studies. And these, I think, will add uh, valuable uh, detail and understanding to the approach that we took and how our, our, our findings uh, were arrived at. And so the first of these is an example of a synergistic interaction involving precipitation and phosphorus loading. And I turn the mic over to Dr. John Bratton. Thanks, Dave. Our first example we'll start off with is a, a case study looking at the pairing of uh, climate change, particularly precipitation and warming uh, and phosphorus loading. And this is an example primarily of additive or synergistic interactions, although there's a caveat to that we'll see on the next slide. So the, each of these case studies will be formatted this way. There'll be an introduction to the, the, uh, the stressors, then a discussion of the mechanisms on a second slide, and finally a, a management and research implications on a third slide. So uh, the climate change aspect here looks at impacts on the Great Lakes with specifically more rainfall overall and more intense storms. Uh, and then high corresponding river flows associated with that, warmer summers that start earlier and end later as well. So the combination of, of uh, precipitation changes and temperature changes, particularly the impacts in the summer. And the, the, uh, the effects of these, considering phosphorus loading, are uh, algal blooms, which are produced by excess nutrients, uh, hypoxia or oxygen depletion in bottom waters by decaying algae and reduced mixing of lakes during summer, and uh, nuisance macroalgae. So uh, the macroalgae grow well in clear, warm, nutrient-rich water. So these phenomena, these three manifestations of excess phosphorus loading uh, all occur in different parts of Lake Erie, but also are present in other areas of the lakes, including uh, Saginaw Bay, Green Bay, and uh, Bay of Quinte uh, in particular. So uh, the ne next slide. So the, the mechanisms here with, with uh, the interactions of rain and heat and nutrients are that more nutrients can grow more algal cells and that toxic algae species in particular or, or strains of species tend to grow better when the temperatures, the water temperatures are hotter. Uh, so the synergistic or additive interaction is that more, more rain and more intense rain yields more soil erosion and loss of fertilizer uh, from agricultural fields and then more nutrients uh, and warmer lake water produce larger toxic blooms uh, and also consume more oxygen as that biomass sinks into the bottom waters uh, under the right, uh, right bathymetric conditions in the lakes to consume oxygen. And then in turn, that low oxygen can release uh, due to, to sediment and oxygen chemistry, release more nutrients back into the water column, which may kind of mix, mix back up and fuel even larger blooms. Uh, there is some potential offsetting here to consider. Uh, so less snow because of warmer temperatures means that there would be less spring runoff. Uh, and then warmer wet springs and early algal blooms could, could effectively burn through the nutrient supply and reduce late summer blooms uh, because all the nutrients have been used up, which was possibly the case uh, in Lake Erie in 2018, although it's probably not a typical condition. Uh, so the last slide in this case study looks at uh, management implications and research implications. So uh, phosphorus P-loading reductions from changing agricultural practices such as conservation tillage, 
uh, use of cover crops in the wintertime, uh, nutrient management using 4R principles, maybe offset partially by climate change impacts. Uh, so that needs to be considered in figuring out what the appropriate uh, level of adoption of those practices is. Also ongoing questions about how legacy phosphorus and new phosphorus get from fields to lakes are current topics of research, uh, as well as the most effective ways to reduce this transport once phosphorus leaves a field. Uh, and then the, the third bullet here, enhancing ecosystem services by wetland restoration, uh, creation or enhancement of riparian buffers and two-stage ditches, et cetera, can improve the system resilience to climate change overall. So those, those types of activities uh, have multiple benefits and can also potentially offset multiple stressors. And then finally, the long-term monitoring of farm practices, uh, river flows and river loads and lake conditions is necessary to detect the trends and also to focus uh, management actions. Uh, so that will conclude this, this case study and we'll shift over to Karen Kidd at McMaster University for the next one. Thank you very much, John. Good morning and welcome everyone. So my case study is on antagonism. So just as a reminder, this is when two stressors act together to have less than additive effects. And the stressors I'm talking about today are likely familiar to many of you, that's PCBs and phosphorus. So just a bit of background, PCBs were widely used in electrical equipment, oils, paints, plastics, until they were banned in the 1970s. And the reason that they were banned is because PCBs are very persistent, they accumulate in organisms, they concentrate through food webs, and they can cause health effects in humans, fish, and wildlife. There's a lot of things that influence PCBs in fish, for example, what they eat, how fast they grow, how old they are, um, and how contaminated their diet is. We know that PCBs in organisms accumulate faster than they're lost, so they tend to build up in bodies over time. And we also know that there's this transfer of PCBs up through the food web. And it's shown in this figure on the right of the slide where you see much higher levels in a, a consumer than in its food source. And this is a process called biomagnification or the concentration of PCBs through the food web. And this is the process that leads to elevated levels in upper trophic levels and then the toxic effects of PCBs and other persistent contaminants. The good news here is that the ban of PCBs has reduced the levels in the Great Lakes. The second stressor is phosphorus, and you've already heard that excess nutrient inputs, excess phosphorus inputs increase algal blooms, such as what we're seeing in Lake Erie. And also this phosphorus input in ecosystems leads to greater productivity in the system overall, higher growth of the organisms, including fish. So the key message on this slide is that each of these stressors individually has adverse effects in the Great Lakes ecosystems. Next slide, please. So how do these two stressors interact to be antagonistic? Well, that's what this slide is about. So um, what we know is that if you look at the two figures on the right, the top one is a system where phosphorus inputs are lower. So you see less algae, plankton, fish in this food web. The bottom figure is showing a system that receives a lot of phosphorus input. So you have more algae at the base of the food web, more organisms in the different trophic levels. And in both of those food webs, there's still this concentration of PCBs from lower to higher trophic levels. But in the bottom food web where there's more algae, you get reduced levels of PCBs in the algae because of dilution. And you also get reduced levels of PCBs in the fish because those fish tend to grow faster. We also know that in more productive systems, you get more burial of PCBs to the sediment, so there's more of a loss mechanism. And so these three mechanisms together um, are antagonistic to reduce PCB levels in the Great Lakes. So first you get a dilution at the base of the food web, you get a dilution because the fish grow faster, and then you get more burial 
We also should mention the spatial con considerations here. So there can be strong linkages between these stressors in shallow embayments like Western Lake Erie, whereas you don't see this in the Eastern part of that Great Lake. And finally, antagonism also occurs with other toxic chemicals like flame retardants, mercury, DDT, et cetera. So the key message on this slide is that phosphorus has an antagonistic effect on PCB levels by reducing the concentrations in the food web. My last slide is about um, management implications. So in contrast to the, the other case studies we're talking about here today, this is a case or a challenge where the reduction of one stressor here, phosphorus, can increase the levels of another stressor here, PCBs. I mentioned before that PCB levels in the Great Lakes are going down, and this is a graph showing PCBs in Lake Trout and Lake Ontario over time. So you see this declining trend from the 1970s to recent years. You also see that the PCB levels in recent years are plateauing. And over the same time period is when the phosphorus levels in Lake Ontario declined. So some of the plateau in the PCB levels may be related to the declines in phosphorus levels in Lake Ontario. While this antagonism should be considered in the co-management of toxic chemicals and nutrients, we encourage continued reductions in phosphorus loadings to help with the eutrophication of Lake Erie. So the key message on this last slide is that it's important to be aware of this antagonistic interaction and to monitor both toxic chemicals and nutrients concurrently. Thank you very much and I'll turn it over to Mike Murray. Thank you, Karen. Our third case, uh, case study is on mercury and wetlands loss. So this is an example where we have both types of interactions, both in, in additive and synergistic effect, as well as antagonistic effect possible, depending on the situation. I'm sure everyone on the webinar is well aware of the issues with mercury in the Great Lakes, threats to human health. It's a common cause of fish consumption advisories throughout the basin, also poses threats to fish and wildlife. And it's methylmercury in particular that is a concern out in the environment because it tends to bioaccumulate and biomagnify to a greater extent through processes that Karen just uh, went through for PCBs. Different, uh, and I'll touch on differences just shortly between the mercury and PCBs. Mercury concentrations and biota are affected by a number of factors, including just the loads of mercury to the environment, as well as the extent of mercury methylation that occurs. And then wetlands themselves are important in the Great Lakes, multiple ecosystem functions and services that has been touched on previously. But we've seen significant losses of wetlands historically in the Great Lakes, including over 90% of wetlands losses in some coastal areas of the lakes. In terms of the mechanisms uh, of the interaction between uh, mercury and uh, wetlands loss, the next slide, the uh, wetlands are the are important sites of methylmercury production. If you see the figure over here on the right, the uh, wet, where wetlands are, are very productive systems, when plants and animals die and decompose, they consume oxygen in that process. Those low oxygen conditions then are very favorable for uh, uh, say the presence of certain bacteria, say sulfate reducing uh, 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 bacteria that can then uh, transform the inorganic mercury into uh, methylmercury. Again, then that, and then that methylmercury can be released from the uh, wetlands uh, soil or sediment, get up into the water. And then that again is the form that more readily bioaccumulates into the uh, uh, lower levels of the food web, say the phytoplankton, and then also more readily biomagnifies to higher levels into the zooplankton and fish in, in the food web. And there are a number of factors involved in this whole process, including oxygen levels. Again, lower oxygen levels are more uh, favorable to methylmercury production, again, which is very common in wetlands, in particular, depending on uh, water levels. And those water level changes themselves can affect uh, oxygen levels, uh, other conditions. And then the microorganism activity, whether you have those specific, uh, say, sulfate reducing bacteria, other organisms available that are, are important in production of methylmercury. So in terms of the, then the overall effects, wetland loss can potentially mobilize 
total mercury, it's the inorganic mercury export. If you don't have the wetlands there, as with other contaminants, you have greater potential for contaminants moving from the watershed into a surface water body. So you lose the wetlands, you have greater potential for mercury transport directly into a surface water. On the other hand, you have the potential for an antagonistic effect where you have wetlands loss uh, with leading to decreased methylmercury production because it's their important sites again of methylmercury production. If you have less wet, fewer wetlands, you're gonna have less methylmercury produced. So the, both of those factors are, are important in any given area and, and, and they, the, the local conditions may determine which, which factor in the end is more significant in terms of the uh, resulting methylmercury concentrations out in, uh, out in the surface water. And then to uh, conclude on the next slide, in terms of the management and research app implications, Wetlands have a number of ecosystem functions and services, again, touched on previously. In, in, in addition to sequestering contaminants, such as mercury and other uh, uh, pollutants, they also provide important habitat throughout the region. And it can be challenging to generalize this particular interaction between toxic chemicals and wetlands loss because of uh, some of the specifics here that with mercury, in particular, the, the fact that mercury and transformation of methylmercury is such an important part of, of what ultimately happens with mercury and including its buildup in food webs. And so, the, uh, so that's going to be a, a difference that we have with uh, mercury that we don't necessarily have with other pollutants, PCBs that, and others that don't go through, through the same transformation processes in a wetland. There's still a lot of research questions need to be addressed, even though a lot is understood now about mercury and and wetlands and, and mercury cycling. But and in terms of management, it may actually be context dependent. We might have a different management response in a more urban contaminated site uh, with a lot of contaminants and potentially where we even have say a constructed wetland versus a more pristine site, such as that photo on the right there, which is Little Rock Lake in uh, Northern Wisconsin. And there was interesting recent research looking at how methyl mercury levels in the water and in organisms in lakes and number of lakes, close to 200 lakes in the region varied uh, quite uh, systematically with water levels. Higher water levels led to higher methylmercury levels and lower levels uh, led to lower methylmercury levels, a pattern that was seen through uh, time. And so the management implications of that are less clear because there's obviously with a lot of these remote lakes challenges to managing, but it, uh, it does indicate something that we need to be aware of when we're interpreting data and thinking about broader management implications of all of our work, uh, whether it's addressing mercury or wetlands loss in the Great Lakes. With that, I'll turn it back to Dave Allen. Thank you, Mike and Karen and John. I think those three case studies uh, really illustrate uh, the range of, of possible interactions between uh, pairs of stressors, uh, the approach that we uh, used in our study group to evaluate those uh, effects. And, uh, and, and how they may be important to management. So I'm gonna turn now to our, our findings and recommendations uh, in four slides. And so the first of these is simply to reiterate that stressor interactions in the Great Lakes are important to consider and are likely to result in an overall increase in cumulative ecosystem stress. We feel there's a need for continued attention to this issue and we think the infrastructure organization and governance systems that already exist in the Great Lakes Basin uh, are adequate for that, uh, for, for, for that to occur. And at this point in our understanding of stressor, stressor interactions in the Great Lakes, there's really no, uh, we felt no clear resolution to whether we should continue traditional stressor by stressor management or move towards more holistic integrated management of stressors within an explicit framework of interacting stressors. And there may be no general answer to, to that. It may, it may depend on context, on pairs of stressors, uh, on, on location, and the sorts of uh, variables that were illustrated by the case studies. So our first recommendation to the parties, U.S. and Canadian governments, and other stakeholders that support Great Lakes monitoring and research programs is to investigate the gaps in understanding of stressor interactions described in this report, because we're really at a fairly early stage of trying to bring this into our conversation on, uh, on management. And the emphasis uh, likely should be on those uh, stressor interactions most likely to have an impact. 
and be amenable to management intervention at appropriate scales. If I may have the next slide, please. We, we note that um, quantitative syntheses, valuable as they are, are often limited to controlled laboratory settings, mesocosms, uh, single species or life stages that are amenable to ex experimental study. Um, they demonstrate that stressor interactions likely occur and ecosystem responses to both individual stressors and interacting stressors may be nonlinear, which makes them difficult to predict such that cumulative stress may push ecosystem beyond tipping points that are difficult to anticipate. We note of, of a positive uh, element is there are existing Great Lakes management programs that consider stressor interactions, uh, work on areas of concern, Great Lakes fisheries management are programs that explicitly do consider uh, stressor interactions. And these programs may hold promise for an improved understanding of management and for the development of, of approaches uh, for considering interactions. So our second recommendation is that any management actions in the Great Lakes by parties, state and local governments, tribes, First Nations and Métis governments should be targeted towards interactions that are best understood and current management approaches that uh, do consider multiple stressors, provide a model that can be incorporated into approaches for addressing interactions in other, in other settings. Uh, the next slide, please. The return to the topic of context, uh, that spatial and temporal variability in the occurrence of individual stressors and long-term trends in their intensity are important contextual considerations in the evaluation of stressor interactions. It is true, however, that the majority of stressors originate on land where agricultural and urban activities are most pronounced. And so the in intensity of many stressors is likely to be greatest in your shore waters and decrease with distance from shore. So this gives us some idea uh, of, of where to anticipate the greatest influence of stressor interactions. And then uh, another reminder of complexity here is that stressors can vary with weather extremes, with ecosystem conditions, and drivers of human activity. And so in some cases, the analysis of these interactions may be required to take place at a relatively fine spatial and temporal scale. Recommendation number three, lessons learned from science and management efforts that identify important stressor interactions should include this spatial, temporal, and other contextual information that is critical to information sharing, lessons learned, and the transferability of information. Finally, climate change is the most pervasive stressor that merits further consideration in terms of interactions. It interacts with toxic chemicals, with invasive species, with habitat loss, nutrients, pathogens, surely others. Uh, our fourth recommendation is that the parties tailor their Great Lakes science and management programs to explicitly consider how the multiple facets of climate change may interact with other stressors and manage wherever possible towards enhancing ecosystem resilience. With that, we conclude the formal portion of our presentation. Thank you very much for your presence and, and uh, listening to us here today. And I turn it back to Matthew to MC the questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allen and, and other panelists. Uh, very informative. Uh, uh, presentation. I would I would draw listeners' attention to the report itself, um, which was promoted uh, with the webinar notice. Uh, there are a number of other pairs that were examined, uh, stressor pairs that were examined in some detail beyond the three that were presented as case studies here, and so um, certainly a diversity of information is included in that report. Um, Getting quite a few um, chats and, and Q&A around availability of the presentation slides. So we will shortly after the conclusion of the webinar, we will be posting this slide deck to the IJC Science Advisory Board uh, webpage at IJC.org and then search under boards for Science Advisory Board. Um, we've also had a uh, impressive uh, number of, of uh, very insightful questions here and um, some themes um, are being detected in, in some of the questions. Um, 
I guess I'll perhaps lead off Dr. Allen with a question for you. Um, the webinar has been very helpful in explaining the complexity of, of stress interactions. Um, and there's a focus of this work, uh, perhaps reflective of the fact that it's a science advisory board effort on uh, research and science related matters. Um, are there concrete management steps that can be taken uh, relative to this issue? Over to you, Dr. Allen. Sure, thank you, thank you. Uh, for this question. So it's true that the study group did not believe it was necessary to recommend new research programs, new governments, new policies to address these issues. But there is really frequent men mention uh, of the potential for stressor interactions to magnify harm to the Great Lakes. So we felt it was really important to clarify the complexity of these issues, to shed light on the potential for offsetting as well as enhancing effects. Uh, and the role that local conditions, uh, spatial and temporal uh, context plays in, in, the, uh, in the effects of, of stressor interaction. So uh, for these reasons, um, uh, we think that, that all programs that are focused and particularly climate programs that are, are focused on Great Lakes management should have within them some explicit consideration of how the stressor under consideration interacts with other stressors. Uh, and we can look to some existing programs, as I mentioned, areas of concern management and Great Lakes fisheries management that do use these frameworks. And so I think um, adoption of such a framework, making it simply something that gets routine consideration I think that is uh, where we feel we are at this point in, in terms of, of our recommendations uh, overall. Thanks, Dr. Allen. I don't know if any other panelists have anything to add to that. Um, another question, I've got quite a few questions actually coming in. Let's perhaps direct this to you, Dr. Bratton. Uh, it's related to phosphorus and, and, and climate. Um, and in particular, bringing it to a geographic um, locale, um, how do we know what's happening out in Lake Erie and its tributaries regarding things like changing river flows, temperatures, nutrient loads, and the impacts that we're observing in the lake, uh, harmful algal blooms, macroalgae, and the hypoxic dead zone? Uh you, Matthew, that's a good question. All of these phenomena are, are monitored to varying degrees into spatial and temporal resolution across the Great Lakes. Uh, up among the lakes, Lake Erie is probably the best monitored uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are challenges, I think, in integrating those, those data sets that are collected from satellites and buoys and uh, instruments placed in rivers and, and various places around the system. So. Uh, as the kind of uh, the magnitude of data available increases exponentially, the ability to digest those and, and kind of extract meaningful uh, information related to multiple stressors and, and what the management uh, action that should be taken uh, is always complicated. But, but we are getting to a point where we have much more data to make these decisions where in the past we, we didn't really even uh, have the ability to know what was happening in the system. Thanks, Dr. Bratton. Um, there was a question, a, a comment and a question that came in. This one's for you, Dr. Kidd. Um, a comment and a question that came in relative to the, the PCB example. There was a sort of a, a comment that PCB antagonism may also be enhanced by increased organic carbon from algal, algal burial, which would uh, reduce bioavailability. And so you may wish to comment on that comment, but the question, Dr. Kidd, was in addition to PCBs, what other persistent chlorinated compounds behave similarly? Right, so there's a number of them that also concentrate up through the food web, like I showed for PCBs. So we know that DDT and mercury, some uh, brominated flame retardants, some fluorinated compounds, um, have the same concentration process. And a lot of these persistent organic pollutants are being heavily restricted in use and banned from production in North America and other countries, um, well, globally. 
And so they're part of a lot of monitoring programs by provincial and state and tribal governments. And certainly many of the ones that have been banned, as I showed for PCBs, are um, declining in levels, which is good news. And we tend to be more concerned about their levels in areas where there's legacy industrial inputs. Um, but overall, the good news, I noticed there was a question about the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that, that um, in terms of toxic chemicals or many tox toxic chemicals has shown um, benefits of that agreement as we're seeing reductions in a number of toxic chemicals in our fish and fish eating wildlife. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kidd. Sort of, if I may, a related um, question that's, that's uh, been posted is it's around this balance between calls to reduce phosphorus uh, to limit productivity, and the example is 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 the is Lake Erie, and in particular, I suppose the western part of the lake, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the impact that reductions in phosphorus might have on uh, PCBs and any any comments around the sweet spot there, um, you know that, that paradigm. It, unfortunately, we don't know where that sweet spot is. That's that's a big discussion right now in the community. Is what what targets um, do we need to achieve for phosphorus that would not increase the PCB levels or the flame retardant levels or mercury levels and um, unfortunately, the communities that look at phosphorus and look at toxic chemicals don't often interact. And I think this report that we've generated has really identified the need for these kinds of programs to come together and discuss things like that sweet spot. Um, and I did forget to talk about the burial process too, and just acknowledge that the comment about PCB burial because of higher organic carbon in algae and, and that process of sedimentation is, is quite an important an antagonistic response as well for to toxic chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in about specific stressors and whether they were examined through the effort. Um, and examples of specific stressors are, are thermal emissions from, from nuclear plants and other sources, uh, shoreline hardening, upland forest loss, and you know I think all participants could generate quite a lengthy list of stressors that are worthy of consideration. Uh, Dr. Allen, perhaps like just for you to, to um, speak briefly to the challenge that the project team had relative to the longer list of stressors and how a select number of those were selected and why this analysis holds insights for other stressors that might not have been explicitly examined through the report. Dr. Thank Allen? you. Thank you. Yes, you know, it's, it's an important question and it's one, it's one we really struggled with. So let me back up um, to some uh, work that I was associated with prior to this project, which resulted in that map that had 34 stressors in it. And that project, which uh, was a several year effort with, with a, a wonderful research team, started out identifying 50 stressors that we thought were important on the Great Lakes. Uh, and uh, we were attempting to map all 50 stressors. We ended up mapping 34 of them. And honestly, uh, there was some pretty arm wavy assumptions in being able to even manage 34. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a winnowing process here that, that inevitably happens. And it was, it was a, a guiding um, uh, perspective of this project that we should, uh, you know, we, we, we need to look at the stressors that are likely to be most important. Uh, for which we can say something about the importance of, of the interactions. And so that's really what, what guided us. Um, you'll note that the seven priority stressors uh, are high level categories. So if you were to look at the more specific uh, examples of individual stressors, we actually went far, be, far beyond seven. We had, you know, we considered multiple invasive species, multiple toxic chemicals, uh, and, uh, and, and so, you become essentially uh, 
able to make progress from where there's some existing knowledge in the scientific literature and where that knowledge guides you to the, um, the, the, the likelihood of the importance of the stressors acting individually and the possibility for them to interact. So yes, there's, uh, there's, there's more work that could be done uh, and, uh, and additional stressors. I noticed one question that came in had to do with, with road salt. Uh, that's not something that we considered. Uh, I, it would probably have only a very local effect within the Great Lakes due to the dilution capacity of, of those water bodies. Uh, but I am familiar with the uh, studies of road salt in river systems and we know that their concentrations are increasing and we know that some species of, uh, for example, aquatic insects are, are sensitive to salinity levels. Uh, but to my knowledge, there has been uh, little attention paid to what else road salt might interact with. So we're getting now to the, to the uh, areas where the, you know, the science needs to move forward to help us understand these other topics better. Thanks, Dr. Allen. Um, yeah, one other um, theme that's in the in the Q and A is uh, around water levels in particular. And I I'm wondering, Allison, if we might post a link to uh, another IJC webinar that was held in July, where the issue of water levels and uh, the ability to influence water levels was discussed. Um, in terms of this science advisory board report. Um, there wasn't uh, one of the, the, the stressors that was examined in detail was not um, water levels explicitly, although a number of related stressors were considered, for example, climate change. Um, earlier webinars from IJC explain, you know, the, the Great Lakes is, is, a, is a large system and lake levels are largely driven by uh, weather, specifically net basin supplies, which includes precipitation over lake surface uh, runoff from tributaries and, and, and evaporation and, and, and transpiration. Um, when it comes to IJC's role uh, related to water levels, there's only two locations governed by the IJC for regulating outflows, one at the St. Mary's River and another at the St. Lawrence River at Cornwall and Messina. Um, the influence water levels, albeit um, in a limited fashion, given the overwhelming uh, signal from, from the weather is what primarily drives lake levels. Um, the IJC and its control boards uh, do make science-based decisions about regulation plans at those um, flow control structures, and more information can be found on the web pages of those control boards. So I'm wondering if we might get those to folks via the chat uh, function as well, um, Allison. Um, question that's come up generally is, is whether any of the panelists could provide some specific examples of gaps in our understanding as it relates to either some of the specific case studies or um, other, case, other uh, pairs that might have been examined in the um, project report. So I'll open it up to all panelists, whether there's a, a specific gap or two you might want to raise or identify to illustrate the kinds of gaps that we, um, we, we found during the course of this analysis. Well, I'll offer, I'll offer just one, uh, and that is there's a potential for more than two-way interactions. And uh, that was something that, that we talked about and again felt it was simply going uh, beyond what we can easily consider. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we did talk about the influence of uh, wetlands um, and, and mercury while water levels influence the degree to which wetlands are inundated. And so one can get to uh, very complicated uh, p potential for, for for multiple scenarios of how stressors interact with one another. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this Mike, I was just gonna follow up that, Dave, on your point. I think that's an important one on in terms of wetlands and, and mercury. And in my uh, assessment of the recent literature, there has still not been as much work on the Great Lakes themselves, coastal wetlands in the Great Lakes, with regard to mercury 
uh, you know, methylmercury production and the implications for the say the near shore waters. You know, there's historically been a lot of work on the inland lakes, uh, you know, that I've talked about in northern Wisconsin, other up in you know Canada, experimental lakes area in Minnesota. A lot of areas around the Great Lakes have seen inland water bodies have seen a lot of work with, with respect to mercury and wetlands, but less so the coastal waters. Partly, I think the you know the levels are often a little bit lower in the Great Lakes, a little bit less concern maybe compared to some of the inland waters. But still, I think there is room for more research uh, into the implications of water level changes and, and wetlands, just the wetlands condition themselves, but in particular, and as well, the relationship to methylmercury uh, production. And I'll just jump in and add around toxic chemicals. I mentioned how phosphorus and PCBs are antagonistic, but that decline in the PCB lake trout levels I showed uh, may be related to changes in other stressors too, like invasive species. And I noticed there were a couple of, of comments in the questions about shifting diets of fish and shifting diets of fish eating birds and how that's complicating some of the long-term trends we're seeing in toxic chemicals in these species. So certainly back to Dave's point that our understanding of some stressor pairs is okay, but when you put more than two stressors together um, and try and understand what's going on in the systems, it, it's, um, it's a real challenge at this point. And building on that, this is John Bratton. Uh, I think there's recognition of that in some of the programs that Dave mentioned, like the areas of concern program, mm -hmm. where the you know the degraded urban areas, for the most part, that are the areas of concern. Uh, the management actions to address them haven't just been remove the stressor, uh, or or maybe a broader recognition that say contaminated sediments alone are not the only stressor that habitat loss is also a stressor. So along with sediment removals, there have been uh, habitat restoration activities. I think broadly looking at, you know, improving the resilience of the system, both, you know, restoring habitat, uh, restoring biodiversity may be the best approach to deal with what's a very complicated set of stressors that, that uh, we may not be able to understand, you know, anytime soon. Uh, just enhancing the ecosystem services and the resilience of the system might be the best approach. Thanks, uh, panelists. So, see a number of questions and, and to some degree comments um, on the diversity of representation of the uh, team that completed the analysis as well as use of the, of the output of the reporting product. Um, for different jurisdictions and groups. And, and one of the questions was around the degree to which indigenous ways of knowing were considered in the analysis. And, you know, my sort of um, recollection of that is that uh, we had hoped to have that reflected um, more strongly in the, uh, in the effort. Um, I know that this is something that um, we've been trying to do here at the International Joint Commission as various boards for a while now. Um, there's been some progress in this area. We've got uh, Indigenous representation, for example, on our Science Advisory Board, as well as the other Great Lakes Board, the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Um, I know it's a very high priority for the current commission. Um, and so we're looking for ways to do that better. And if there's any individual uh, Indigenous organizations uh, who are listening or either now or, or the recording, who, who want to help us with this priority, we'd be very interested in, in hearing from you. Another question that's come up a few times is the degree to which uh, the state and provincial uh, entities were involved in, in the study and, and also how they might